message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there is a God-given design for its study. Rightly dividing the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for another interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, President of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join them now. We're certainly glad to have you with us today as we look again into the Word of God and uh, seek to have some instruction out of the book of Romans. Romans chapter number 16. We're, we finally made it down to the last chapter in the book of Romans as we've been slowly moving our way through uh, this basic uh, book, or maybe I should say this book of basics uh, about orientation to grace. The grace of God is the way he, he works and operates today. We live under the administration of His grace. And it's important, it's vitally important that we understand the issue of what grace is and how it operates. That's what the book of Romans is designed to do, is to show you uh, and orient you to the grace of God. The first book you need to read after you become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is the book of Romans. You need to be able to master this book and, and get your feet nailed down in the preparation of the gospel of peace. And we've seen repeatedly that the book of Romans is in four sections, or four foundation principles uh, to grace laid out in the book of Romans. Uh, the last one is chapter, in the section chapter 12 to 16 has to do with practical instructions about the, the walk of a believer today as an adult in the family of God not being tossed about like children to and fro by every wind of doctrine, but be able to stand up as, a, as an adult, sufficient in Christ, understanding our all-sufficiency in Christ, and that we are sufficient uh, to stand lacking nothing, no matter what the circumstances of life. Our sufficiency is not in our circumstances. It's not in our uh, ability to have the circumstances controlled or changed or, or manipulated, our sufficiency, no matter what happens in life, is in Christ. And my friend, the life that you have is in Christ. And anything else beyond that is just joy <laughs> and uh, wonderful thing. Well, Romans 16 is, is what, I, what I think you can call a, a grace age hall of faith. The, the, Paul brings uh, the great epistle to the Romans to a close by mentioning some of the believers who are dear to him and who, who assisted him in his ministry. And he, and he puts a long list of saints here. There are nine women mentioned in the passage, six people that are relatives of Paul, 27 people in all are named, and there, there are actually 21 different titles given to the saints. And by the way, nobody's called reverend in this passage. There are no bishops, there are no cardinals, there are no religious titles, but there's titles like sister and servant and beloved and kinsman and fellow worker and fellow prisoner and fellow laborer. Those are the titles that God gives to the saints. He doesn't give a bunch of religious titles for you to go around and lord it over God's heritage with. Rather, he gives these, these are the, the wonderful titles that Paul gives. The title Paul loved the most, I think, was saints. <laughs> saints of the Most High God. And brothers and sisters, brethren, family members, part of the household of God. Well, Paul lists the, the believers uh, in Romans 16. And you say, well, why would he pick out these people? Well, he lists them as examples to you and me. Much as the writer of the book of Hebrews lists uh, a, a long list in Hebrews chapter 11 of examples for the nation Israel. Um, Israel's problem all through its history was always a lack of faith. In fact, Romans chapter 9 tells us why when the Lord Jesus Christ came, Israel didn't receive Him and didn't recognize Him. Romans 9 verse 30 says, what shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained unto righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained the... I mean, the Gentiles that didn't have the revelation in the law of God, they've attained God's righteousness because when God's word came to them, they just believed it. But Israel 
who, who had a table spread by God, who had the blessings and the service and the promises and the covenants, they didn't attain God's righteousness. Why? Because they didn't believe God. They didn't trust His Word. Wherefore, he says, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. You see, Israel's problem all along was a lack of faith in God's Word. And that's why, if you go over to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 11, the writer of Hebrews uh, stresses this point over and over. And he stresses this issue of faith uh, by giving Israel a, a, a number of examples, by rehearsing for them a number of examples out of their history about faith. Hebrews 11 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand. Verse 4, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. Verse 5, By faith Enoch was translated. Verse 7, By faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark. Uh, verse 8, by faith, Abraham uh, does the things there. Verse 20, uh, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob. Verse 22, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, so on and so on. The, the thing goes, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. And these people are listed there as examples of, of the thing that Israel missed and, and failed to have, and that was faith. And what the nation had to do was have faith in God's promise to it that God would do that which He promised them to do. And so in Hebrews 11, He, he, he lists a whole long list uh, in a hall of faith to demonstrate to Israel what faith would do. How that trusting God in spite of, uh, of, of, of anything else, just believing what God had to say to them uh, through His Word, and he demonstrates the, the, uh, the achievements of faith. Well, so it is in Romans chapter number 16. In the closing section of the book of Romans, Paul has been dealing with the service of the believer in the age of grace. Our sonship walk, our service for God. And he's been giving practical illustrations of it. In chapter 15, he talked about his own life and the decision-making process, and how he, he, he applied the will of God, the Word of God, to the, to the details of his life, so that he went about doing the will of God in his life. We talked about prayer associated with that, and the decision-making processes that Paul went through. Well, in chapter 16, he moves on from himself, so that you don't think this is exclusively just for the apostles, out into the rank-and-file believers of his day. Uh, the people that Paul lists here in Romans 16... Are, are clearly examples of how members of the body of Christ ought to serve. It's, they're examples of what our service ought to be. Um, these people are built on the foundation that Paul laid. And uh, certainly that, that's where we should be. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 9. Paul says, For we, we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building according to the grace of God which is given unto me. As a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Paul didn't build on the foundation that was here before him. He didn't build on the ministry of Peter and the apostles and the earthly ministry of Christ or the promises of, of, of the Old Testament prophets. Paul came along and laid a new foundation with a new program for a new agency, the church, the body of Christ, and a new dispensation called the dispensation of grace. And he laid the foundation. Then he says, when you lay a foundation, you're starting something new. A new building's going up. Then he says, let every man take heed how he builds thereon. And it's these saints in Romans 16 that are building on that foundation. And the dedication of these early members of the body of Christ is, is the dedication that you and I should have in order to build on Paul's foundation. Not just to be on it but in order to serve. And, and what he's doing is just, again, it's just practical living demonstrations of what a sonship walk would be like. Now, there's a lot you can learn from this passage about, uh, about service by looking at the lives of those that assisted Paul in his ministry. There, are, there is, in fact, in the city of Rome, three different local grace churches. Uh, if, you, if you look at verse number uh, 3, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ, 
who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Priscilla and Aquila had a, a, a church meeting. In their, now, now, you know, at this time, all of the believers, every local church that you see in Paul's ministry met in some, almost all of them. Not, uh, there's one or two exceptions, but they met in people's homes. And when the Bible talks about stuff going on in the house, that's where the local church was meeting. And they met at Priscilla and Aquila's house. So there's a local church there. Then if you go down to verse 14, uh, he says, Salute Asyncritus and Philegon uh, and Hermas and Patrobus and Hermes and uh, the brethren which are with them. So there's a church over here with those brethren and there's one, two, three, four, five elders in that assembly there that meet with them. doesn't say where they met, but they meet over there. So there's a Grace Church meeting at Priscilla and Aquila's, and then there's the Grace Church meeting with the folks in verse 14. And then verse 15, salute follow uh, Jesus and Julia and uh, Narius and his sister and Olympus and all the saints which are with them. So there's a local church meeting over here, a local church meeting over there, and a local church meeting. There are at least three lo local Grace Churches in the city of Rome, and Paul's never even been there. Isn't that interesting? He's trying to go there for the first time and sends the letter ahead before he gets there. You know what that is? Look with me at 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. Something very important. You know, sometimes people call me or write me and they say, you know, Brother Rick, we, we appreciate understanding the Word of God rightly divided. And we appreciate the message of grace and we're rejoicing in it here in our community. Is there a grace church where we live? Well, listen to what Paul said. The things, 2 Timothy 2, verse 1 and 2. And thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Take a stand and let God's grace be where your strength is. And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. What Timothy learned from Paul. The same commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. Paul taught the doctrine to Timothy. Timothy taught it to others who could go teach it to others. Somebody says, well, Brother Rick, we need a grace church in our town. Send us somebody. No, no, no. That's not the issue. That's not the way this is done. They didn't wait for Paul to get there to have a grace church. They had the grace church because there were some folks practicing 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. They took the doctrine they were taught by, by Paul and they communicated it to others who could teach others also. Now watch the people do this. Romans 16. Look at, look, look at who these people were that accomplished that. Romans 16, 1, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is in Sincrea. So now there's a church in Sincrea, which is over by Corinth. Here's a lady. She's a servant. That's, that's who we are, folks. Paul says, let a man so count of us as, as, as ministers, as, as, as stewards of the mysteries of God. Stewards, servants. That's who we are. Phoebe was a lady, a lady who probably delivered the epistle to the Romans. Isn't it interesting he puts a lady first? <laughs> yeah, that's great, isn't it? It's instructive, isn't it? Sometimes people don't want women involved in the work of the ministry. Sometimes women want to take over. <laughs> That's no good. But sometimes fundies don't like ladies involved too much. Here's a lady that actually Paul gave the book of Romans to for her to deliver. She's a servant. You know how you get the you know how you do the work of the ministry and how you serve God today? You take the position of a servant. Not a lord, not a celebrity. We live in the day of Christian celebrities, TV personalities, radio people, print media. It's almost like a circus out there in, in Christendom. That wasn't Phoebe. Notice how she's doing this, verse 2. That you receive her in the Lord as become of the saints, and that you assist her in whatever business she had need of you. For she hath been a succor of many and of my... 
Phoebe is a business lady, and she's going to go from Sincrea over to Rome. And she's going to take the epistle of Romans from Paul over to the Roman saints. You see what's happening there? In the normal course of her life, for Phoebe's service was not Oh, God, should I go to the mission field? And if I should, what field should I go to? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. let me stick the tail on the donkey. So, no. She wasn't doing that kind of nonsense. She wasn't saying, well, God called me to the ministry and God told me. No, she didn't. Not that kind of, kind of hocus pocus tomfoolery. Wasn't a Ouija board religion. Just in the normal course of her life. Do you understand that in the normal details of your life, just as you're doing business in concourse every day, that's where God works? Because God works in you and through you. And it was Phoebe, he just uses her in the normal activities of her daily life. That ought to encourage you, it does me. I don't have to be some great mission... Just in my normal daily life, my business life, recreation life, social life, whatever, day in, day out, I'm a servant. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ. Now, Priscilla and Aquila are quite a couple. Uh, they're very special to Paul, who have, for my life, laid down their own necks. Um, in Acts 18, Priscilla and Aquila got saved under Paul's ministry. And he worked with them making tents for a while. It was a, they had a common occupation. And he worked with them there in Acts 18. They got saved. They began to grow in an understanding of, of the Word of God and, and, and the grace of God. And if you go to Acts chapter 18, you find something very interesting. Because in Acts 18, 24, you come upon a man by the name of Apollos. And he was a Jew, Acts 18, 24. A certain Jew named Apollos, born of, at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. Now, if he was born in Alexandria, Alexandria was, was the, the location of the great library in, in, northern, in northern Africa. And Alexandria was a great center of learning uh, back in that, that time period. And he, he, was, a, he, he was a man who, who was in, uh, exposed to uh, human viewpoint at its max. It's sort of like coming from Harvard or Yale or Stanford or somewhere like that. And uh, is, what is the, the description. But he was also mighty in the Scriptures. And verse 25 says, This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in the Spirit. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. He wasn't aware of anything from God except the baptism of John. Now you say, well, where has he been? I mean, this is like 50, 55 A.D. Christ has been dead for 20 years. He doesn't know about the crucifixion. He doesn't know about the resurrection. He doesn't know about the, the day of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't know about the setting aside of Israel. He doesn't know about the message going out. I mean, he's still back with John the Baptist, you know. But he's mighty in what he's doing. Verse 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue whom he would be preaching, repent, the kingdom of heaven's at hand. He'd be preaching John's message. Who when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them, listen, and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. They took Apollos and began to teach him God's word and brought him up to date. They brought him up to perfection. They brought him up to date on what God was doing. Because he was way back there. He, he had what he had, but he didn't have everything that was available. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhort, wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through, not John the Baptist's message, but grace. And whose message was that? It was the ministry that Paul received of the Lord to testify the gospel of the grace of God. John the Baptist didn't preach that. John the Baptist preached Israel's prophetic program about the kingdom. Repent the kingdom of heaven's at hand. A Apollos starts out back there. That's where he was. He meets a curl on Priscilla, and what do they do? 
the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. And he was. Who shall teach others also? Apollos goes in, in the, in, into Greece, and the brethren there find him very helpful. Well, see, because he's teaching them the way of grace. He's doing what? 1 Corinthians 16, Paul said he's a brother beloved. He's someone, we have help. He's able to teach others also. Those that Paul had taught, Romans 16, they were servants, but they were serving in the right way. They just used their life as service in all of its details, not compartmentalizing it over here on Sunday or Wednesday night or a certain time, but it's just all of life, like Phoebe. And they were able to teach others in such a way that they then could go out and teach others. They literally practiced 2 Timothy 2. That's why there are three grace churches in Rome. And that's how to get some established where you are and where I am. Um, Priscilla and Aquila are really examples, folks, of what we should be striving for in our ministry. Verse number 5, uh, uh, he talks about the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved, and uh, uh, so forth. He, he begins to talk about these other people here. Verse, verse 6, greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us, and Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. Paul talks about kinfolks here. Verse 11, salute uh, Herodian, my kinsmen. Greet them which are of the household of Narcissus, which are uh, in, in, in the Lord. Verse 21, Timothy, my work fellow, and, and Lucas, and Jason, and Sopater, and my, my kinsmen. It's a wonderful thing. Paul had family members. <laughs> he actually had kinfolks in the work with him. You know, I don't think there's anything any more exciting than to see godly generations. That is, generation after generation, parents to children, godly generations serving God. I've had the privilege as a pastor to, to be a part of probably uh, eight or ten uh, 50th wedding anniversaries of saints in our assembly that have, have gathered together after 50 years and they have their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren and to see godly heritage. You know, many of us can't look up the line of our lives very far with a godly heritage. Many of us don't have that privilege. If you do, thank God for it and value it and use it. Many of us can't do that, but we can look the other way. It's a wonderful privilege to be able to use your family for the things of God. You're going down through the passage, Paul also makes special mention of, of people that had labored for the cause of Christ. Verse 6, greet Mary who bestowed much labor on us. Verse 9, salute Urbane, our helper in Christ. Um, someone who's come along and, and helped and been, a, been, been of aid to him. Salute Apellus, approved in Christ. Uh, the, the, the whole thing going down through here is that these people labor. They worked. That word labor means to strive and labor to the point of exhaustion. You know something, folks? The work of the ministry is work. You know that? You got the idea you're just going to... It's, it's, it's sometimes there's work and there's labor involved. Verse 13, there's a very special guy. I love this fellow. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Rufus' mom was so dear to Paul, he considered her his mom. That's a wonderful relationship. Rufus' daddy was somebody too. If you go back to Mark chapter 15, Mark chapter 15, verse uh, 21, when the Lord Jesus Christ had been scourged and, and beaten, a cross had been placed on his back, and he was led away to Golgotha's hill to be crucified, the Bible says that he fell under the weight of that cross and couldn't carry it any further. And Mark 15, 21 says, And they compel one Simon, a Cyrene, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And now you find Rufus mentioned over here in the Hall of Faith over here in Romans 16 as someone who had ministered with Paul, having been instructed by his parents, his mother, and taught as Timothy was. You go down to verse 23, Gaius, mine host, 
of, and of the whole church salute you, Erastus, the chamberlain of the city, Quartus, those are three men that lived and were a part of the carnal assembly there at Corinth who had remained true to the Word of God. You know, when we talk about the carnal Corinthians, all of the Corinthians weren't carnal. All of the Corinthians weren't unfaithful. All the Corinthians weren't babies. There were men like these three, three giants, Gaius and Erastus and Quartus, who had been faithful in the midst of apostasy and carnality. It's possible for you to be in that group. You see, my friend, Paul makes it very clear that there's to be unity and companionship among the members of the body of Christ. That's why he says, salute one another with a holy kiss. A holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute thee. You know what he's talking about there? All these people mentioned by Paul in Romans 16, you can see examples of what our life and our service to God should be like as believers. If you're a child of God today, serving God doesn't have to do with building a building and, and promoting programs and, and, and keeping the push going to keep the system going. It has to do with the, do the life of Jesus Christ living in you, living itself out through your mortal body of flesh as you by faith stand in the grace of God. As you understand and appreciate the grace of God, it's to that measure that the Lord Jesus Christ is able to control and use your life for His glory. My friend, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, we're not talking about religion. We're talking about life in Christ Jesus. And it's yours, free as a gift of God, simply by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. You do that today, will you? Until next time. Thank you, Brother Jordan, for that message from the Word of God. Friends, we have a cassette tape we'd like you to have to go along today's study. The tape is entitled, A Grace Age Hall of Faith. It's yours free of charge. It's our way of saying thanks for listening. We'll be happy to see that you receive your free copy along with a free subscription to our monthly Bible study, The Grace Journal, if you simply write us here at The Message of Grace. The item should be on your screen. That's The Message of Grace, Box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. If you prefer, you can also call us during regular business hours at area code 708-529-0520. Request tape offer number 363. That's tape offer number 363. The Message of Grace is a ministry of Grace School of the Bible, and we're glad you've been with us today. If our study together has been a help to you, we'll be happy to put you in touch with the Bible study in this area where the message of God's wonderful grace is proclaimed from His rightly divided word. And friend, if you're still not sure of salvation, that your sins are forgiven, and that you have eternal life as a present possession, let us know, and we'll be happy to send you some gospel literature that will show you the way. The address again is The Message of Grace, Box 97, Bloomingdale, Illinois, 60108. Thanks for being with us today, and God's best until we meet next time for another Message of Grace.